My name is Jonah Jonathan and welcome once again to the Jazz Musician's Voice. Today I'm doing an interview with Justin Kay, the son of jazz drummer Randy Kay. And we talk about Randy's life. He passed away in 2008, but we have a lot of interesting discussion and I think you guys will really enjoy this interview. So thanks for watching. Stay tuned. We've got other future interviews coming. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, today I have the rare pleasure of speaking with uh, Randy Kay's son, Justin Kay. And we're going to be talking about uh, Randy Kay, a uh, world famous drummer. Uh, I got a chance to play with him a couple of times when I was first starting out on bass. But unfortunately, he passed away in 2008, right? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, uh, Justin is making a documentary about his dad, and uh, I made a short little thing. Uh, wow, it's already 2019. I made a short little tribute to uh, Randy. Um, let's talk about your dad, like, in terms of his early years. He uh, yeah. he came up in Brooklyn, New York, right, and uh, ended up playing with some very famous musicians sitting in and playing with like uh, Paul Chambers, for example. Yeah. Uh, Jackie Byard. Uh, talk mm -hmm. about that, that time. Sure. Well, the, the backstory is his dad, my grandfather, Alan Kay, he was a saxophone player and a uh, big band guy. He did some touring with uh, Bunny Berrigan was one of the biggest names that I'm aware of that my grandfather played with. So, and then um, my father's mother was also a singer. So he grew up in a, in a musical household. And um, my understanding was probably around the age of 10 or 11 is when he first started to play the drums. But I think prior to that, he may have had some piano lessons, I suspect. He also played the saxophone, which his his father played, and his dad taught him how to read music. That's uh, really great. You know, reading is so important, especially, uh, you know, uh, jazz musicians. You know, you know, Randy eventually played with Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix couldn't read, so I'm assuming he probably looked to Randy as a, uh, a resource you know for that yeah well let's let's circle back around to that a little bit later but yeah I wanted to speak to his earlier years like you said one of his first big gigs was yeah in a, a band uh, Tony Scott's band and it was Jackie Byard and Paul Chambers and I sort of learned about it later in life sort of just talking to my dad kind of interviewing him off the cuff uh just over uh say a glass of wine and um you know these stories would come out and i know he was interviewed shortly before he passed uh by a english biographer that was that did a book on paul chambers and and he called up randy and wanted to hear about those uh those sessions with Tony Scott and Jackie Byard and something really interesting. <clears throat> there's a documentary, a great documentary on Jackie Byard. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's short. It's under 30 minutes, but watching it, um, it really made me like sort of wonder what, what my dad got from him. I'm sure a lot I can imagine just his attitude and like his attitude towards the music and specifically Bayard would talk about like, you know, like he wasn't going for the Grammys, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said like, that's, that's just not where it was at for him. And I feel like that was sort of Randy was really dedicated to the art in the same way that like a Jackie Bayard was. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, it's, it's incredible to to think that he was playing that stuff at such a young age. You know, he he was sitting in from like fifteen, right? He was already sitting in at the Vanguard, and uh, yeah, they 
he actually had a there was a group and i have actually some of those recordings when he was 15 but uh it was called the new york jazz ensemble and um there were it was a five-piece band saxophone player by the name of joel peskin uh steve blum on guitar and um a couple other cats but yeah, he, they were playing regular at the Vanguard, maybe opening up or uh, for larger acts and things like that. And I know that, yeah, he was just on the scene at that time. I know he played at Slugs <coughs> Saloon. And I'm not, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, maybe that was the the place where Lee Morgan. Yeah, um, actually, uh, that's shot, where Lee, or... Lee Morgan was shot. Uh, I right. I did an interview with Harold Mayburn, and he was actually on the bandstand that night that uh, Lee Morgan got shot. And uh, yeah. Slugs is, apparently what happened was there was a, a snowstorm, and the ambulance couldn't get to the, the club in quick enough time. But that that was a pretty uh, grimy club from what I heard. You know, there's a lot of yeah, uh, so... cats there, you know. <laughs> Yeah, my dad was hanging out there, you know, at 16, 17, playing, playing at these places. Uh, and uh, I know there are other other clubs that some of the names escape me at the moment. But, uh, yeah, he was really active. And um, I would say sort of a, a little bit after that, um, he he actually sort of formed his own group and I actually wanted to show this. It's a uh, real to real that I uncovered after my dad passed. Wow. Um, so it's uh, Steve Tintweiss and who was a bassist and uh, Enrico Rava uh, who's a Italian uh, horn player. And I actually, got this italian record label to to re to release it so they were they were all my dad's tunes um so he didn't get to release an album as a as a band leader while he was alive but when i found this after he passed i i knew that i had to get it out there so yeah, yeah. you can hear it on spotify just wanted to give that little plug and yeah, you know you can buy we, copies of the disc have to check it out you know uh um so yeah, that was 1967. So he was ostensibly, you know, a composer, musician, percussionist at that time at 20 years old. Um, and like we said, rubbing elbows with these very uh, heavy musicians. I know he uh, had some jams with uh, Roland Kirk for for sure um maybe in his apartment or something like that but i know that was one one person he was i think probably proud of having the opportunity to jam with yeah well uh let's talk about now uh probably the biggest claim to fame of your dad in early years was playing with uh, Jimi hendrix in a band um yeah, and then, from what I understand, uh, the manager put an end to it before uh, Woodstock. But talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so I I've done quite a bit of <clears throat> research on that era in Hendrix's career, and um, I had the opportunity to interview Mister Juma Sultan, who was a bassist, percussionist, uh, composer, great soul, loves a guy, uh, very humble and generous man. And I, I was able to interview him. And anyways, he was one of the cats that was on the Woodstock gig. He was a percussionist. Uh, you might remember him from the Woodstock video. He had, he might've been shirtless or had an open vest and he had on these great purple pants and he was playing like congas and all sorts of percussion. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, he remembered Randy well. And 
talked about the time before Woodstock playing with Hendrix. And so they had at least one gig I know at the Tinker Street um, Theater now or Tinker Street Performing Center in Woodstock. It's now where maybe it's called Upstate Films or something like that is. It's a little um, theater. But so that was sort of a well-known gig. And that was some information that I had to go on. And so I interviewed Juma Sultan, but I was also simultaneously doing a lot of research online, trying to find more information and came across, there was a fan site that I think is now defunct. And it was sort of a, you know, people were uploading bootlegs and photos and I found some threads and the name of the band was the Gypsy Sun and Rainbows. Okay, that was the band going into Woodstock. And my understanding of, yes, Hendrix wanted to maybe present a larger band. I sense maybe he was inspired by what Miles was doing with sort of the bitches brew kind of thing. And it sounded like Jimmy wanted to go kind of more in that direction. That's my humble opinion. I, I could be yeah. wrong. But with more horns, more uh, dynamics, and and like you said, um, Jimmy was really a self-taught musician from what I could understand and, and didn't really read music. So in that context of Randy playing with Hendrix at that time, as great as Hendrix was, on some level, I think Randy was maybe bringing Jimmy more into his realm of more space and roots yeah. jazz stuff. You know, I, I did an interview with uh, Dave Holland and yeah. uh, you know, maybe it was one of my, my, not my best interview because I didn't know too, too much information to, to talk to Dave Holland about, but um, he told me he played with Hendrix in the studios in New York and they had jam yeah. sessions and uh, Miles was also wanting to play with Hendrix. Um, I assume your dad may have been involved with those two cats as well. You know, it's possible. Yeah, I, I heard the story. I think maybe it was Tony Williams and, and Miles were going to record with Hendrix, but maybe they both wanted what the Jimmy's uh, management thought was too much money and didn't pay him and it didn't happen. But wow, well, that would have been amazing to hear just even those three guys playing. Oh yeah. That would have been. So, um, so that's sad that that never happened. But <clears throat> so Randy, I, I wanted to say I did, you know, I grew up hearing, he didn't, like you said, he was a humble guy. He wasn't braggadocio at all about this stuff. And, yeah. but he, you know, there were Hendrix albums around and he said, yeah, I played with a guy and I was like, wow, really? And some of my friends in school who were maybe into music or whatever, got wind of this. <laughs> what? Your, your dad really played with Hendrix? So it was the, yeah. it was sort of the, the legend. And there were some people that maybe didn't, but really, did he really play with them? So I wanted just for posterity and myself i wanted to hear a recording and i was able to on this website track down these bootlegs and i'm listening to it and i'm hearing specifically the thing that tipped me off was the cymbal sound and i'm like that's my dad and it, there's a track it's called sundance you can look it up jimmy hendrix sundance and it's just him randy and and juma sultan on bass just like a trio and um yeah it's it's really beautiful and hendrix is playing like almost in like a almost a spanish guitar kind of style like um la like really acoustic you know really nice stuff and so you can hear like this whole other side of him just on this track of, did, of hendrix's did, did playing they live together in a mansion a rented so, mansion in woodstock so yeah, uh, Jimmy, I guess maybe owned this home uh, near the Shokin Reservoir, 
and um it looks like uh i've been there was there on the property juma took me down there and showed me and there's like a big i could sort of envision it there's a big patio outside and i could see and there's pictures of it where there's just all these musicians kind of set up on the patio or it just sounded like there was music happening all the time and yeah, I think he did stay there some. He also may have, Hendrix may have put him up in a motel in town. Um, but my my mom and dad were just, had just met. And my mom came along uh, for this, you know, the these sessions with Hendrix. And so she has stories of having a meal with him or just hanging out there what what she remembers <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. That's a, i mean it's a it's really an incredible uh thing to think about i remember um hanging out with uh your dad as i was with my dad my dad was kind of there as a chaperone and um you know i was really into hendrix at the time you know because that that's how I got into jazz. I heard, um, are you experienced? And, you know, I was listening to a lot of Hendrix and I remember Randy telling me about playing with Hendrix kind of like, uh, Oh yeah, I played with him, you know, and it, he didn't, he didn't want to brag about it, but he, he did talk about it like that. And that to me, that was like an incredible thing at that time, you know, I was blown away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, me, there there could have been i think as much as he respected hendrix and i'm sure enjoyed the experience and i know he looked looked back at it fondly um there were other guys that he was playing with that he felt uh were kind of beyond what even jimmy was doing for example uh sonny Chirac, the great guitar player sonny Chirac. randy also uh, played with him and I remember I, I interviewed my dad before he passed and one of the he, he mentioned that specifically <clears throat> he felt like Sonny Chirac was ahead of Hendrix in terms of his concept yeah essentially yeah. you know it's uh it's interesting to think about like uh if you got someone like Carlos Santana didn't die from drugs and went on to do his thing and eventually got into people like Wayne Shorter and Coltrane and, you know, all talking about all th those things. I, I would assume uh, Jimmy might have gotten into jazz and kept going in that direction had he not passed away, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very well could have been. And that was maybe a uh, part of the reason the, uh, the management wanted to put an end to it because it might have not been so uh, economically viable for them or lucrative for them, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So talk about, yeah. uh, you know, how did your dad get to the Berkshires, Berkshire, Massachusetts? That's, that's where. Uh, sure. So yeah, this is sort of it. following a, a somewhat linear timeline. So shortly after, Hendrix is when Randy first linked up with Jimmy Jufri. And my understanding is that for a long time, anybody who knows Jimmy Jufri, uh, he didn't have a drummer in any of his groups. His groups were, you know, drummer lists. The prior to him hiring Randy, the last drummer that he used was Shelly Mann in probably the 50s. And so all throughout the 60s, you know, Jimmy Jufri's work was largely a trio with Paul Blay and Steve Swallow. And so he was sort of coming out of that. And I guess he just wanted to do something. Jimmy wanted to do something different. And I believe that sheila jordan uh maybe recommended randy as a percussionist drummer to to jimmy jufri that's that's my memory of it is randy had worked with sheila and um you know said that he would 
be a great fit. And so Jimmy formed a trio with Randy and a bassist by the name of Kiyoshi Tokunaga. And they did two records. Um, I believe they were originally on Choice. I'm not sure if both of them, but Choice Records. And it seems like people are maybe just now maybe rediscovering Jimmy Jufri or discovering him for the first time, maybe new listeners. And I'm just noticing there are people that are interested in this album and uh, or these albums, this this early 70s work with Jufri. And yeah, it's they're they're really amazing. If you haven't heard them, you got to hear those. So that was so going, you know, segueing out of that was is this is all to say this is why he moved to the Berkshires because Jimmy Jufri moved to West Stockbridge, Massachusetts, in probably the mid seventies, I guess. And I think at first Randy was still living in New York. And he was probably coming up to visit Jimmy and and practice and record at Jimmy's house. Um, And I think he probably fell in love with the area. And then also he had this musical, uh, you know, brother and commitment to, to Jimmy's work. So really it's Jimmy Jufri's influence of, him being in the Berkshires is really what brought Randy to uh, buy a house uh, with my mother in Stockbridge, Massachusetts um, on Cherry Street. You know, the the, uh, the Lennox School of Jazz was in that that same area. And a lot yeah. of uh, musicians uh, from earlier years mentioned it. You know, I talked to, to Ron Carter about that. The Lennox School of Jazz, and I talked to uh, uh, the bassist uh, out of Chuck Israel's out of um, yeah uh, Seattle, you know, or uh, Portland, Oregon, and mm-hmm. you know, it's interesting because Randy eventually became one of the 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 big cats in that area pushing forward jazz, you know, I would go to the uh, Great Barrington Castle Street Cafe and all of those spots around there. And, uh, you know, you never realize that people have been doing jazz in that area for the past, you know, 50 years, you know. Right. And and I appreciate you bring that up because it um, at times when people talk about the Berkshires, uh, they they make reference to the Lennox School of Jazz, and then they might be promoting a current uh, gig or whatever, and and then I I sometimes go like, hey, there's a whole there's a whole history, there's decades of music that's in between there that is sort of unrecognized at times when I. I hear uh, people speak or write about jazz in the Berkshires, you know, currently. Um, sometimes Jufri's mentioned, but yeah, there, there's, there are a lot of other players, contemporaries of Randy's who, you know, he played with in the area for years, like uh, John Sauer, uh, great pianist, keyboard player. And he probably played more gigs with John Sauer than any other musician. And they played all sorts of things, you know, wedding gigs that, you know, that was the thing. So Randy played, you know, all sorts of situations, Uh, you know, New Year's Eve parties, wedding gigs, you know, suit and tie, playing tunes. And he could do it all. Like we said, he was very adept uh, in, you know, most of the time he didn't even need to read the music. If they were standards, he knew them. We were talking about the Berkshires and, Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes it's, as you said, there's the history of the Lennox School of Jazz. And that is a a prolific um, 
I don't know what to call it. It was moment, let's say, in, yeah. you know, jazz history right here in my backyard in Lenox. And, you know, people like Ornette were there and oh, all yeah. sorts of creatives. So Jimmy Jufrey, like I said, he brought my dad to the area, more or less. And... um and I also wanted to mention and when my parents first moved to the Berkshires, my dad didn't have a lot of work. I, I think outside of, you know, he had the Jimmy thing, but it took him a little while to establish himself in the area. And I know at the time my mom was essentially supporting them. They didn't have me yet, but he wasn't making too much bread and my mom was traveling back to New York. She was a hairdresser and she would go to the city for a few days and do, you know, hair and come back with some money and would be, they, when they first bought their house, this is how they were living. And it took Randy a while to, to establish a local connection um, to musicians and gigs. But then, you know, one of the people that was, most prominent was John Sauer, who is a great pianist, keyboard player from the the Berkshires. And I know as a teenager, I believe he had a band with Kenny Aronoff. Everybody knows Kenny Aronoff, a great session drummer from the Berkshires. And um, but him and Sa Randy and John Sauer, um, they played a lot at the Red Lion the lion's den at the time you would go down these stairs. Have you ever been there to the lion's den? You go down you the know, stairs. I, and I think I've passed by it once, you know, I, you know, you probably know I went to Simon's rock college at Bard. So I was in that area, the same area you live, you know, yeah. but I wasn't there that long, you know? So, yeah, I think even, I think at the time, maybe, Kenny Aaron, when my dad first moved here, I think Kenny Aronoff maybe had was playing some with John Sauer at the Red Lion Inn. And I think even according to Kenny, you know, he said then Randy Kay kind of showed up on the scene and that he was the real jazz guy. And I, I don't know if how it happened, but if the Red Lion Inn really wanted like a jazz trio, and I think uh, so I think Randy stepped in with John Sauer and probably at the time, um, you know, there could have been a couple different people playing bass, but another bassist that played a lot with those guys was Richard Downs. Did you know Richard Downs at all? Uh, I think I might've heard the name, but I don't. Yeah. So he, so they played a lot together at the Red Lion and in, in the eighties, Randy would be playing, you know, jazz trio gigs at the Red Lion in the Lion's Den, you know, a couple nights a week. And that was within a mile of his home. And um, they had a lot of other music going on there. And, you know, people like Arlo Guthrie probably performed there at some time or another. So, yeah. And then... um. So Randy was, you know, at that time in the Berkshires for a couple years and he wasn't recording with Jufri for a little while, but then Jufri sort of, I think maybe to some degree was probably inspired or liked some of the weather report stuff, or at least the electric, a little bit of the electric that he was getting from from that group and he wanted to do something not something similar but wanted to incorporate synthesizers and electric bass essentially and so he formed a new group jimmy jufri four which was again my dad on drums and percussion and jimmy played a, a bass flute clarinet saxophone and then there was uh, Bob Nesky from Boston on bass, electric bass, and also uh, Pete Levin on keyboard synthesizers, uh, brother of Tony Levin. And they have a group together, the Levin Brothers. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of stuff that was 
well before my time that you know of that uh so yeah you got to get out there you know because yeah i'm uh, trying to i'm trying to share share a little bit now you know some of the touchstones in the period that we have together but yeah so that that group i would say is maybe the group that randy is most well known for is the jimmy jufri four with that lineup those guys and they recorded three albums with uh the record label soul note i believe it was called in the 80s and it got I think bought and now the releases are done under maybe Black Saint is the name. So just to say those albums are Dragonfly, uh, Quasar, and um, Liquid Dancers, all the Jimmy Jufri Four with that lineup. And they were together for not quite 10 years, but yeah, just almost about 10 years they recorded three albums toured a lot to europe uh did some jazz cruises in the north atlantic in the north sea um that's actually a funny story Juanita jufri who um the jufris were uh or are uh very dear to my family and were fam family friends who would spend holidays with jimmy and his wife Juanita, who's also a composer and a great visual artist painter in her own right and she did all the album covers to that group's releases uh really amazing artwork you have to you gotta lit if you haven't really heard those you gotta dig into those they're on yeah. spotify okay people are just discovering this stuff and like Say I'd say it's not like Weather Report at all, but I'd say if you dig Weather Report, you know, yeah, to anybody, dig, give dig this. give this group a try and listen to what Jimmy was doing. Different, you know, much more space and kind of uh, out there, less no grooves really. Jimmy was not really into grooves, although he might have appreciated it in somebody else's work. He, so that's why Randy was perfect um, for Jimmy Jufri's group because Randy wasn't your typical drummer as you know, and as a lot of musicians have noted, you know, he, <clears throat> he was, it was more about playing like colors <laughs> um, yeah. or, um a feel as opposed to being a timekeeper or playing the beat yeah i remember you know it, my my recollection of uh of randy was at castle street cafe playing with um uh pete twigo or playing with um uh, alan livermore and yeah. they would do uh they would do stuff where he would have his mallets and he would be hitting the cymbals and making it, it, it was colorful. It wasn't like a drummer. It was like he was playing it, painting, painting a, a sound, you know, <laughs> that's what I could describe it as, you know, and I, I, uh, at the time I was at Simon's Rock College of Bard, I could go down there, you know, a couple of times a week, you know. I normally see them over there. Yeah. Yeah, I was at some of those Castle Street gigs and uh I wish I record I wish I had some recordings of a lot of that stuff. Yeah. But but sadly I don't. But yeah, that was, you know, one of the venues that you could go to hear him. So yeah, he was really playing all over the Berkshires from the early 80s till his you know, till his passing in 2008, almost 30 years, really, um, playing all sorts of venues, gigs. There was even a local jazz festival uh, at Butternut a couple of years. And he, this was in the probably late 90s. And I think he sort of 
was a uh, he was an instigator, let's say, in in trying to I think keep some of the freer stuff alive in the area. I think he was at the time one of the ones, you know, one of the few that was stepping outside of just playing tunes. So they got he got this gig at this jazz festival at Butternut and he brought in Ed Mann, uh, who was a vibraphone player, and he played in Frank Zappa's band for many years. So it was Randy, Ed Mann, and uh, I think Charlie Tokars, and uh, John Sauer, and I'm not exactly sure who was playing bass, but um, yeah, it was great. And there weren't really, they weren't playing to a big crowd but it didn't matter. It didn't matter to Randy. That was the thing, you know, a lot of people have sort of noted about him is it didn't matter what the gig was for him, whether he was playing for nothing or a couple bucks at some dive, or if he was playing at the Berlin Opera House with Jimmy Jufri, like he brought the same level of kind of love and intensity and attention to his playing and the music no matter where he was or what group he was in and that brings me also to like he really loved his cymbals but like he what you know i know a lot of drummers are like they're gearheads you know, and it's that's cool. Like, it's cool to, like, get new stuff. But Randy was really, like, he, he only had a couple of kits that I know of in his life. Maybe three. Two main ones that I know of. And he had his, the symbols that he used, I think he had his whole life. Um, the hi-hat maybe wasn't as old, but his symbols he had from probably his teen years or in there. Um, and he had a really uh, amazing sizzle that had these rivets that he, I think maybe had some metal worker, somebody who knew put these rivets in. And I've heard other drummers that have sizzles. And to me, uh, they don't, ha it doesn't have like the same quality as these older, I don't know what the, if the material is different, but to me, I, I notice a difference in the resonance of like the old symbols that my dad had versus like some new Zildjian that comes out and is being promoted by whoever. Yeah. I so mean, yeah, uh... he, he wasn't so into, you know, having a lot of drums. He had a small kit and he basically, whatever gig he was on, it was the same setup. It didn't change. He had a marimba that he would play on some gigs and in a conga and a lot and a bag of toys. I don't know. Did you ever see him pull out his any of his toys or little percussion things you know it's it's fuzzy time to remember yeah for me because uh, you know i i was like 15 16 you know uh mind you i'm yeah. almost 35 now so it was a long time ago but i do You're i do remember him making uh unique sounds that no one could uh no no one could replicate he was doing you know and he would make uh if i recall he would make these grunts when he was playing mm -hmm. and it would go with the go with the music but right if i recall yeah yeah and he almost like he would be like uh, sometimes almost humming yep yeah he... <laughs> along but yeah and it was part of the music it went with the music, and, you know. But it wasn't this the thing is, is like it wasn't a put on. No. You know, it wasn't it wasn't an act or it wasn't he wasn't trying to when he was doing that, it was that what 
that's what was coming out of him. And yeah. also you see his his body movements to me. I've you know, I'm not a musician, I wanna say, but I'm a big fan of music and jazz music specifically and have watched a lot of great drummers and um one of the things that to me that was really unique about my father was how he would sort of follow through with the movements with you know it wasn't just and it was almost like he was sometimes coming up off the the drum head yeah. like it wasn't he was never it, I, it was never bashing he was almost no it was almost like he was caressing the drums and that's not to say he couldn't play heavily like we heard him play with Jimi hendrix although he did say he apparently he had to flip his sticks around and play with the the butt of his sticks he said in order to be heard over jimmy a lot of the time because hendrix was so loud he's had to just turn his drumsticks around and get like a thicker sound that was something he yeah. mentioned technically about playing with jimmy yeah but, i mean it, you know for i i'm trying to remember the name of the the music store in pittsfield where it ended. yeah it's wood wood brothers wood brothers wood I used, brothers so i bought my store. first electric yep. bass there and i remember yeah. uh he was teaching over there but there was there was such a a legendary thing about randy i mean like uh, he he really was a jazz cat and you don't you didn't see that those type of people in the Berkshires, you know. <laughs> he he was his own unique <laughs> person, you know. And then uh, yeah, I I remember uh, it's probably one of the reasons I got more interested in jazz. You know, I I, I wanted to be like Randy. You know, <laughs> it was just cool. You know, we so all. So when you got cool. when you was it a Fender you got or yeah, I got a Fender. Mm -hmm uh fender highway one jazz bass or something like that yeah and did he ever when when you knew he was there did you meet him then and because i've heard of times where there were even children like yourself at the time that were playing other instruments and he would invite them in he would say hey do you want to try the drums or yeah, like he, just in a really like open way, not trying to persuade you to play drums, just to be like, hey, do you want to check this out? Or hey, let's play together. I've heard this, yeah. and and so I, I it's just uh, I want to communicate that he really had a such a deep love for the music, and this almost ingrained inherent uh, responsibility to pass that passion and joy yeah. along to like the next generation see how i got started in uh in jazz was my dad had me enrolled in alan livermore's jazz 101 class in berkshire community college and we used to go around to different uh nursing homes and places and play and uh i have the memory of playing a few gigs where where Randy was there and he was hanging out and uh you know that there was one time we were up in uh Williamstown Mass playing a gig and his uh his girlfriend Elaine at the time was singing and she she was she would ha hang along with him you know and you know I, I have some I have some thoughts about that but I won't I won't put them on this interview <laughs> <laughs> yeah she you know because she would stay singing she would keep singing for a long time and you know yeah uh, compete with I other think, singers yeah mm, yeah there i i could say a lot but yeah i've heard that from other people that there were maybe some of elaine's sort of up being omnipresent in Randy's professional life may have sort of soured some relationships because like you said, maybe she, she didn't want to stop singing, but maybe that wasn't the gig. And then there would be some friction 
um, maybe in uh, not an opportune moment or yeah. space and sort of combined with alcohol, um, it's not a good recipe. But yeah, yeah. I, I even have, I think, a recording from Helsinki. Did you ever go to any of those gigs? You know, I was been playing to, with Pete Twigo. I've been to Helsinki. You know, I I would check out Pete Twigo. You know, uh, yeah. You know, he but they they would play. They probably played early two thousands before I even started playing jazz. Um, you know? Yeah, I think he was playing with Pete Twigo in the eighties. I think <laughs> even the eighties. Yeah, I mean uh, Pete Twigo. I think Pete Twigo said my dad called him or something when he was 19 i don't know and invited him to play on something but yeah i've got some great recordings i'll have to get you you have to send me your mailing address yeah the helsinki which i i'll get to but yeah um i did want to touch on specifically you had mentioned it in the little video that you did which i rewatched the three windows band which Randy really, he, you know, he was a founding member, let's say. It was yeah. called Three Windows because it was originally a trio. And there are some recordings where they play with some other players. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, Andre Jaume, who is a great saxophone and clarinet player <clears throat> from France. And he... And uh, Remy Charmison, who's a amazing guitar player from France, and Randy was the one American. But <clears throat> Randy probably linked up, or Andre probably knew of Randy because Andre and Jimmy Jufri did some collaborating, and Andre might have been a student of Jimmy's, if I'm not mistaken. Those recordings. There isn't enough. <laughs> I wish there were more, but it's a really great group that I wish more people would hear. Um, and to me, it was uh, it was a high point, I think, in Randy's playing. And I think to him it was too. He mentioned that he had some, what he called uh magical gigs with Remy and Andre playing in the south of France um at many different jazz festivals and places like Nice and Avignon and Marseille and they also uh did a lot of playing in Portugal also some just you know uh they did um cafes and jazz venues in france and and portugal but also a lot of festivals and i know there's a video out there somewhere of them playing it's just it's difficult to get uh the it's like probably owned by like the french government or <laughs> it's a um french government run radio station radio france and they put on some festivals and um yeah okay Let's see. so yeah i just wanted to show you this picture is probably not in the mid 90s in france it was taken but yeah i unfortunately i don't have that many shots of him playing like this but this is a nice one. I'm pretty sure he was playing with Remy and Andre. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, that was a, that was like really a great group um, in, I think in Randy's mind. And I think what it enabled him to do was just do whatever he wanted, <laughs> but really he that meant like listening to these guys and then, you know, maybe at times pushing the music a little bit as the drummer. Um, but I think he 
just love playing with Remy and Andre so much because they were willing to go there with Randy because he was at a point where he didn't really want to play tunes. Like at least when they were playing live, you know, Mm -hmm. he didn't want to play tunes and it wasn't really about that with those guys. It was like, we're just going to play for the moment. Um, Yeah. I got some, nice live recordings of that group that I hope to include pieces of in the documentary, but they did. um, There are two albums. One's called resistance three windows. um, And I'll send you links to all this stuff so you can be aware of it. You know, for for the audience watching talk, talk a little bit about the the documentary that you're making, because you've been working on it for uh, more than 10 years yeah <laughs> talk about like uh what's the status of it and yeah well how you, I, you know i was gonna say i brought some things like to show you some of the physical media and well i i just to say like i have a four-year-old now and have a have a life and the documentary is really a passion project and so it's at times been on the back burner um but yeah i'm i'm still working on it hoping to maybe get it out there this year fingers crossed uh but it's really been um a process of discovery for me and also basically being a one-man show i'm not only making a documentary, but I'm also an archivalist. Uh, so like there's a, you know, I've been uh, transferring a bunch of these tapes that my dad had and I've gotten from other people. And actually the, the sound on these old audio tapes really holds up well. But yeah, for this is a tape from Jimmy Jufri 4 recorded at the Iron Horse in Northampton sometime in the 80s probably. Um, and you know, I've got, uh, V tons of VHS. This is a, a concert recording with, um, John Myers, who I think you maybe mentioned at some yeah. point. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I studied with John Myers. Do you know Sean Hurley bassist? He was a local bassist, mm-hmm. went on to be a, a big pop guy, played with like John Mayer and stuff, but he's playing on this recording so yeah it's it's been uh just sort of a ever evolving thing and um like i said i'm i'm still working on it and i'm trying to hopefully get it done this year and i also have felt like there are parts of it now myself being a dad Whereas, as you know, I know you're a father, that making this this thing about my dad has given me a new perspective being a dad, let's say, myself. So Mm -hmm. I'm I'm trusting in that there's something in that piece that is that I had to experience go through in order to maybe fully uh realize my vision for the project if that yeah. makes sense yeah well it, how can uh, people contribute to the documentary or contribute to the memory of randy if they if there's anybody who has memories or uh, yeah i mean stories? i'd like to yep yeah. Well, I've got, like you said, I got the Instagram. It's uh, a Randy K jazz drummer on Instagram. So yeah, if if anybody wanted to contact me there, they can do that. And then uh, my email, which is Justin G K all one word at Gmail. And I'll send that to you or whatever. You can maybe put it up in a graphic for me. Sure. Um, but yeah, if anybody has who sees this, knew him and has a story or, uh, you know, any sort of media, whether it's a photo or a recording or a video, I'm sort of, I'm always 
interested just for myself for posterity um but also you know maybe could be used in the documentary so yeah i've i've got you know a considerable amount of footage of him i wish i had more um unfortunately it wasn't he wasn't so prominent in a time of cell phones where everybody you know could just set up their iphone and record what they were doing in their studio yeah. like and he wasn't really he wasn't a guy who was into self-promotion either so you know it wasn't actually until after his passing that you know when i sort of found out more and more about what he had done and the people he had played with that I realized that I had to make the documentary like so it's been even longer sort of in in my head wanting to do something but yeah I've been in some capacity sort of filming for a little over 10 years um but like I said at times life being a father other things um it hasn't been so pro i'm not a filmmaker or anything by trade yeah it's more like i'm more like a guy with a camera i mean i'm in i love film and have been inspired by it yeah just touch on maybe the helsinki thing but yeah yeah for example i brought a couple of things like i know he would sometimes use these yeah yeah i used to have a couple of those on gigs but yeah i've you know got most of his gear i even have this like old like looks like a handmade kalimba yeah i don't know how much he would use it but this was in his bag um so yeah it's it's been a huge <laughs> Uh, undertaking for me in a way to like collect all these things and try to put it together not being necessarily uh, a fully fledged trained filmmaker some of the tech stuff is you know can be kind of challenging um, but yeah. but yeah I'm like I said I'm I'm hoping I can get it out there I'd like for people to see it um and i think there's a there's a unique voice uh that he had and would like people to have an opportunity to you know hear his playing and hear his music and yeah keep yeah. keep it's basically about you know yeah keeping the spirit of his music alive and <clears throat> But yeah, there you mentioned Alan Livermore, and so like one of his last, I feel like one of his last like musical statements, like that was really unique, was he had this ongoing gig that he sort of created for himself at Club Helsinki when it was in Great Barrington, <clears throat> and he called it the Randy K Trio Plus One. And and basically it was himself, John Sauer, and Pete Twigo. And he would have either Charlie Tokars or Alan Livermore on horns usually. And there were a couple other people that sat in at times. But mainly it was it was his gig. It wasn't a jam session. He he stated that it wasn't like, oh, can I <clears throat> can I just sit in with you? It's like no, we're actually doing something here. It's not just anyone can play. Yeah. Um. So that it he had sort of a vision for that, and part of the vision was like, okay, we're gonna play for a couple hours, basically, and like we're not gonna plan anything, and we're not gonna play any tunes or any tunes that you know or have heard of. Um maybe sometimes he would pull out an old tune of his and rework it with that group 
but yeah i have all those recordings like i said i gotta send them to you yeah a lot of them are are really special and there are times where you can hear him speaking or he would even do like little sketches sometimes with pete twigo humor within the set like really Mm. hum like funny stuff um but yeah you can hear his voice um at the end of the set you know he'd usually introduce the group <clears throat> but uh yeah i i feel like uh he was a like i said a unique player and a unique voice and maybe uh a bit under the radar and uh, I'd love it if a uh, if a new generation of musicians and or percussionists and drummers had the opportunity to to hear my father uh, and and enjoy his playing. Yeah. Well, uh, Justin, thanks for sharing about uh, Randy K. Uh, we'll probably check in again maybe after you finish the documentary. We'll, uh, yeah talk about that but uh yeah thanks for thanks for doing it yeah thank you it's been fun i appreciate it yeah thanks for the opportunity yeah thanks